Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, with Dr. Giovanni Ferreira. And he's presenting today, Enabling Patient-Centered Care with Two New Technologies, Needs and Potential Solutions. Uh, Dr. Ferreira graduated in 1998 at the University of Di Ancino in Centi, Italy. Pardon me if, if I don't pronounce these right. He received his specialist training in respiratory disease and his PhD in experimental medicine at the University of Moderna and Reggio Emilia in Italy uh, between 1998 and 2006. He was a visiting researcher at the New York University during his PhD. His work focused on immunology and new immunologic tests for tuberculosis for tuberculosis and on a rare disease called polymer fibrosis disease. He moved to Sweden in 2010, working clinic, both clinically and conducting research at the Kalinske University Hospital and at the Kalinske Institute, receiving there the title of associate professor. He developed and he was also the chairperson of the Swedish Registry for Etiopathic Polymery Fibrosis, an innovative platform with patient interface for the collection of patients' reported outcome measures. He started his position as professor of medicine and director of the Division of Polymery Medicine at the University of Alberta in Edmonton in February 2019. He continues there his research in TB and rare pulmonary diseases. He has a special interest in the validation and implementation of wearable devices and digital solutions in the treatment of respiratory diseases. Dr. Ferreira. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much for the introduction. Most of all, for the very, very kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And uh, yes, uh, my, my talk will be enabling patient-centered care with new technologies, needs, and potential solutions. Uh, this is just a slide for my conflict of interest. So I received a few fees from Berin and Yenheim, Roche and AstraZeneca, mostly for lectures and advisory boards. And I want to acknowledge, especially myself, who I'm a stranger, Basically, I'm a guest in this land, and I want to acknowledge that um, indigenous people were here well before me, and I'm thankful for the opportunities that Canada has given myself and my family. So as my name uh, is probably suggesting, I'm Italian. I'm originally from this little region where I studied, as Sharm said, at the University of Chieti. Uh, it's a nice region with sea and uh, mountains very close to each other. And this is my little hometown, which is very small, but we produce very good wine. And you, you, I'm, I'm sure you heard about the Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, which comes from the same region. This is a dock from my own town, which is called La Vine. And today I'm here in Edmonton, and uh, uh, I am very honored to be the divisional director for the Division of Pulmonary Medicine at the University of Alberta. You see, it's a very nice group of people. This is obviously a, for a picture before the pandemic, and we obviously hope that we will get back soon to this level of human interactions. So my talk will cover four um, different items. So why? it is important to have new solutions. So the complexity of the multidisciplinary approach to ILD, especially to progressive ILD, the new ways to look at the measurements that we currently use for uh, pulmonary function, six minute working test, how we can capture better the patient reporting outcomes and experiences, which are central for a model of patient-centered care and uh, hopes for the future. So let's start with the complexity of a multidisciplinary approach because this is very important. Now, this, we will go very quickly through this. You know very well that the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease is a very complex um, diagnosis and it requires a multidisciplinary approach, meaning the interaction between among uh, respiratory physicians, radiologists, pathologists, and structure in what we call multidisciplinary conferences. This is very well established, both in the American and the US 
society guidelines and in our Canadian guidelines. Here is a panel of very, very, very good experts here in Canada. And you know very well as a patient and as providers that we need the radiology with a CT scan of high quality, high resolution. We might need a bronchoscopy, we might need a biopsy to reach a diagnosis, and we need to review these things all together. So it is complex, it's not simple already at the diagnosis. And you know that these patients unfortunately have um, a story that is marked by progression of this disease. As you see in the slides, this patient experienced quite a severe progression over a few years. And you see how at the end the lungs were basically destroyed by the by the scaring, uh, by the, by, by the fibrosing uh, development. And uh, here is the lung function. This is the FVC, which is an index we use today. And you see how that declined over time. We will go back to the FVC and why we use it today. We know, again, that unfortunately the decline of the uh, pulmonary function can be unreversible. We might be able to slow it down with new therapies. And we know, unfortunately, that the survival of most of these patients, especially those with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and patients with a new IEP pattern on CT scan is, is poor. It is around two to, two to three years as a median. So, why it is so important to have a clear idea on how to take care of these patients. Of course, we say a progressive disease, three, five years, and then it is either transplant or unfortunately death. Now, as I said, we have new drugs like the antifibrotic drugs that are able to slow down the decay of lung functions. Here is the force of vital capacity of the C. This is the treatment arm of patients with uh, progressive fibrosis and interstitial lung diseases. This is the placebo. You see there is a reduction that is 50% of the decay of the pulmonary function. And this is very important because it might lead to an improved survival. There are other drugs that can be used, especially in patients with connective tissue disease, IND, like the um, Sigoposobide and the uh, mycophenolate, which can also stabilize the disease for a little while. There are still many questions about how to combine these drugs. But the point that I want to make here is that with drugs, we treat the disease, we don't treat the patient, meaning our patients have symptoms that are impacting their, their quality of life, especially dyspnea and cough. So we know, unfortunately, that the burden of symptoms increases over time. And we see, we know that certain forms of progressive fibrosis interstitial lung disease, like for instance, scleroderma-related ILD, have the same burden of symptoms compared to IPF, which remains the cornerstone on, of everything we do simply because we have more data about IPF compared to the other, the other PF ILDs. So it is paramount to say that the healthcare system has to provide best supportive care, meaning interventions that are targeted to improve the quality of life of the patients, to reduce the burden of symptoms and to improve their quality of life. And this is possible today. You will see there are a number of interventions that can be in place and should be in place for the patients to help them. As well as we should provide education. It is not enough, you know, to go three times per week to a physiotherapist. We need to be able to live in a certain way, to teach our patients to live in a certain way, to um, reduce the impact of their symptoms and to potentially tackle also uh, worsenings of the way, high exacerbations. And there must be a frank discussion also about what is important for patients, so-called advanced care planning, knowing that unfortunately the end of life could be, could be near. So patients and caregivers and healthcare workers have to be prepared, all of them, 
to know exactly what they have to do. As Sharon says, often lung transplant is an option, unfortunately, is an option only for a very small proportion of patients with PFILD, probably around 15, 20% in the best case scenarios. End of life, as I said before, is very important because, again, patients do not need to die at the hospital, do not need to die with a burden of symptoms that is uncontrolled. There are uh, developments in this area as well, and they should be in place for every patient with PFILDs. So this is the multidisciplinary approach. Why I say that this is so important? Because yes, there are physicians that can know everything, that can manage everything, but they are really unicorns, you know, like a paragon where if we do a, an example with music, you can think about a great, uh, great artist. But frankly, if I consider my generation, we are still learning a lot of things. And if I think about the new generation, physicians that are younger than me, well, I mean, it's barely impossible to know everything. You get to a certain level, at, probably at the end of your career, not at the beginning. And let's say it very frankly, the, the time of the relation of the physician telling the patients you have to do this and that and blah, 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 and I know everything and you just do it is over is over because to, to enable a multidisciplinary care, a patient-centered care, we have to have the, the patient at the center saying exactly which are his or her needs and a number of healthcare workers, a number of providers around the patients, not, less, not least the caregivers that are extremely important. So it is a coordinated approach. It's something that is, an individual physician will never be able to deliver. And obviously, this requires a very high level of coordination and the availability of resources on the territory. And as you know very well, this can be a problem, especially in rural setting or in peripheral setting, not close to main cities, especially in Canada. So how can we try at least to um, reduce the gaps in terms of space and in terms of time. Uh, if there is something we learned from this pandemic is that we need to be able to take care of our patients even without seeing them, without them coming to our clinics or our hospitals, right? And it is in this area that probably the new technologies can offer something, something good. So if we think about lung function, we already said that it is very important to measure the pulmonary function over time to understand which patients are declining. Now, this is exactly what we're talking about, right? This is a PFT box. So patients have to go to a PFT lab, sit in this box and made a, a series of um, uh, maneuvers to, to try to, to have a good spirometry. You see, this is a normal lung and this is what happens when an ILD is in place. So the lung shrinks, the lung shrinks. And that leads to a lower FVC compared to normal. And that's why we use the FVC. It is reproducible. And in clinical trial, data from large data sets from clinical trial, trials was seen that basically the uh, decay of the forces by the capacity, FVC, correlates with mortality. So patients losing more than 10% of the FVC, no matter if absolute or relative, had a much worse survivor compared to those who had a stable FVC over time. That's why we do it. We perform PFTs every six, 12 months. And even when we have a suspicion of a worsening of the patient, because we want to see this parameter. So one of the um, ideas that people started to have already a few years ago was 
Do we really need the big box? Do we really need patients to go to the lab? And now today we have new technologies that are portable, small uh, so-called home spirometry, which do not provide the full range of measurements that we can have in a PFD box in a lab, but they can provide something that is very similar to the FVC. And in fact, this is a study from London, uh, already five years, published already five years ago. And what they did was to provide uh, 50 patients, if I remember correctly, uh, this, this home spirometry and ask them to perform it every single day, possibly morning and evening, like what we do for asthma today. And this group of uh, investigators were able, was able to say it works well. So we can see clearly that the pulmonary function of these people with IPF is declining over time. We, we see people who are declining even faster. And this will be very important because obviously here we are at 100 days, so it's three months. We don't wait for another appointment in person with another physician with a, with a PFT lab to see that this patient is declining. That will be at 180 days, so it will be down here probably. And the patient who have lost a, a huge amount of of lung function. And even that this technique can detect exacerbation, so uh, transitory worsening. What is the, I would say, the statistical base for uh, such a measurements? Is the fact that by measuring several times over the days, the accuracy of the measure is very good because it reduces the standard deviation. So, by measuring the same thing several times, we have a more accurate uh, est estimation of what we are seeing. And it seems to work well. So this study triggered uh, multi-center, uh, multinational study, where a number of people in Europe tried to use, actually it's even in America because the first author is in, uh, is in Chicago, try to use the um, home spirometry to follow up the patients for one year, asking the patients to do it ideally every day, but at least once per week, okay? And they did every week also, uh, um, every four weeks, sorry, they did a normal PFT in the box. Mm -hmm. So what we saw, we saw that Point by point, the correlation with the normal PFT was normal. So this is called an heat map. Uh, you see here correlation coefficient. So if it is red, it means that the standard pulmonary function testing in the lab in the box and the home spirometry say the same things. So at least looking at the, the measurements every four weeks, the correlation between the two methods were, the, the two methods was very good. But what happened then? First of all, the number of times that the patient used the spirometry declined over time because obviously it requires that the patients do use the spirometry every day or at least once per week. And uh, this did not occur. As with everything we do in medicine, patients get tired, they have their own leave, they have their own lives, they, they need to do something else, they forget, they are sick, they forget. I mean, it's, it's, it's life. And what happened then? Then when the investigators tried to see if the home spirometry worked in the same way as the usual PFT, checking how much lung function was lost over time from the baseline and over the year. Unfortunately, the correlation, as you see here, was not the same, was not good enough. And why? Because again, the number of times that the um, 
the patients used the home spirometry was not constant over time. So the accuracy of the measurement was lost over time. So this study had, a, how to say, a, um, gave a mixed feeling about how, you, how to use this. If the patients used it consistently over time, it could be good. But only once per week or sporadically is totally useless because we don't know what these measurements mean in the long time, in the long run. Okay. So this is a very important point because it is about how new technologies, new tools are user friendly, how the patients perceive them, and how they work over time. Excuse me, Dr. Ferrer, sorry to interrupt. Um, a, a patient wanted to know why is it that um, there's more general reference to IPF with the medication and by doctors and insurance companies, but not PF. And um, they wanted to know that because they um, have PF because of rheumatoid arthritis. Yes. Yes, as I said at the very beginning, the bulk of data we have is mostly for IPF, and we use it right or wrong as a surrogate also for the other disease. Now, the, the reason is just time. Uh, it might sound, not to say unfair to say that, but the first internationally recognized definition of IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, was basically agreed upon in 2001, so exactly 20 years ago. And to collect all the data takes time. And unfortunately, I say that sincerely, most of the data we have today are from clinical trials. So there must be a clinical trial to collect data and then, and then ensure that the quality of this data is good. And most of the attention over the last 15 years went to IPF. The FILD is a relatively new concept. And again, comes from a clinical trial that was published less than two years ago. So, that's the only reason we don't have the bulk of data that we have for IPF. And we hope that that will improve over time in the next years. Uh, Dr. Farah, it, would it be uh, fair to say that um, IPF is mentioned more because this disease is so rare, no one really knew what caused it. So that's why it's called the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Whereas now, as you said, 20 years later, we're becoming smarter, we got more data, and now we recognize that other diseases can lead to pulmonary fibrosis. Yeah, most of all, we recognize that other diseases can lead to progressive fibrosis, and that those diseases have the same problems than IPF, or at least very similar ones, yeah. Thank you. Now, let's move on from the PFT to the 6 minute walking test. And again, I'm sorry, but the bulk of data and evidence is in IPF. And we use it also for PFILD. Why we do perform a 6 minute walking test? Well, as you know, it's, it's basically a walk with a constant piece that we ask the patients to perform with their respiratory therapies. It has to be in a standard way measuring the distance and asking the patients regularly and constantly, how do you feel now? And monitoring saturation and uh, uh, pulse. Again, why we use that? Because now it's pretty much pre very something that is very, very clear. Patients that have a lower walking distance already at the beginning have a worse prognosis compared to those who have a, a good walking distance. 
And even changes over time can relate to worsening of the disease and survival. So it's something as that as physicians, we want to know to be sure that everything is okay with our patients. Because when we start to see that the working distance is going down, that the lowest saturation over the test is going down, and that the patient's response I'm more short, I'm shorter of breath today than when I did it three or six months ago. That's a strong signal that the disease is worsening. And that's exactly when we should put interventions. Okay. Now, this is the, the new, the potential innovation. Let's call it like this. If we can depict how a patient feels by asking this patient to work for six minutes. What if we could collect the data of all the activities that the patient is, the patient is doing during the day and correlate them on how the patient feels and potentially on hard surrogates of survival, like again, the pulmonary function testing. So will that be a better way to see the performance status of our patients, their life, their quality of life, and their prognosis? This is a very elegant study by the group in Vancouver, Dr. Ryerson. And uh, what they did was to use uh, activity trackers, they're called. Uh, in this case, what was the actigraph? And I want to make a strong point. These devices have to be approved by Health Canada and they have to be validated as a medical device. Please do not think you can do the same thing with an Apple Watch or you know, with any sort of smartwatch on the market. So what they did was to basically use a questionnaire of activity and see how the patients were active uh, during the day by wearing this, this watch or and uh, uh, waist uh, uh, activity tracker. And they did this at time, at the time zero after uh, six months and after 12 months. But what is very interesting to me is that the, these new tools can actually show very well when the patient is performing something with the maximal physical activity, can detect the calories that the patients are using, the time they don't do anything or sleep. So it is possible really to record very well how the patient is living and ask the patient, how do you feel at the same time? So, that's something that prospectively can give us a much better idea of what the patients are doing, what are their challenges, and so on. And this is a very recent study performed in Australia with uh, uh, 54 patients, again, with IPF. And why we use IPF? Because we are sure that in this diagnosis, the decline of lung function is um constant over time so it's a reference to validate everything else and what we did again was to provide the patients uh, an activity tracker a different one again pretty much medical device and to track calories and steps over over the days uh, for one week the first week after six months after 12 months what we found was that these patients could work around 4,000 4, steps at the beginning. And after one year, we, they lost around 645 steps. And also the energy they spent was lower. So meaning they were more sedentary, probably they were more impacted by their symptoms. And they tried to correlate this with the FVC, again, with the pulmonary function testing to see if there was a sharp decline and the six-minute walking test. And we found that there was no correlation. So 
They saw the patients being less active, um, having a lower calorie consumption over one year, but at the same time, they didn't see the pulmonary function testing, the efficacy and the pulmonary function going down with the same speed. What does it mean? Does it mean that this might be a more sensitive way to, to see how the patients are feeling, what they might need, what we should, that we should intervene before we see the 10% decay in FVC? Frankly, we don't know. And that's why it is so important to design well the studies with not short-term outcomes, but long-term outcomes. So again, we have potentially two or several methods to replace what we do with our pulmonary function testing laboratories and with our physiotherapists, but we need more data. We need the validation. We need to see that these methods are really accurate and good for our patients. That they really say something that is uh, meaningful. Sharon, I don't know if you have questions for this point, or we should, I should move ahead. Uh, sorry, there's no questions at this moment. You can move ahead. Okay, we can move ahead then. So what about patient reported outcome measurements and patient reported experience measurements? And this takes me back again to, to the little cartoon that we showed before about the patient-physician relation. It is not enough today to ask, how are you? How are, are you, how do you say, are you, how is this with your shortness of breath? Is this worse? Is this, is this, is this better? Whatever. We need to measure things. And there are tools that are designed for this. Mostly there are questionnaires. They are game validated with very, very um, uh, well-designed studies. And you see, there are a number of them that have been validated for IPF and so by assumption also for PF ILDs. The St. George Respiratory Question IPF is one of them. I personally like the KBIL, the King's Brief Interstitial Lyme Disease Questionnaire, because this validated in all the ILDs. And uh, these are for general well being, for measuring how this snake, a patient can be a short of breath, and how this can uh, change over time. The cough, to quantify the cough, is very important, as well as anxiety, depression, and other domains like weight loss or comorbidities. And most of all, this is important because we have today interventions for instance, physical rehabilitation that are evidence-based. We know that our patients can feel better and we can measure how they feel better. That's why it is so important to use them, to use this patient-reported outcomes. This is physical rehabilitation, for instance, and this is for um, IUDs in general. And we know that by uh, being part of a training program, the patients can work longer Again, remember from before that the distance, working distance on the six minute working test correlates with survival and with the way the patient feels. In this case, this is a Borg score, which improves with physical rehabilitation. So that's why this is so important. We need to measure, we need to know exactly how our patient feels, mm -hmm. our patients feel not just asking how are you this is not this is not the way what's the problem the problem is that filling the questionnaires and most of all computing their scores is time 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 consuming so that's why today one very good um, area mm -hmm. of innovation could be delivering the questionnaires in a digital format either by email or like in this case, just before we visit with the physician, filling the questionnaires on an iPad, 
because mm -hmm. in this way, the uh, ILD specialist or respiratory specialist will have the scores available for the assessment, for the visit. And that's make a difference, gives a number of information of information that we don't have otherwise. And it's not that difficult. It is really to push on the implementation of digital questionnaires, having the patients who are able to use it even before on their email and helping those that are not so familiar with uh, computers and um, iPads doing that at, at the office. It requires organization and some money probably, but it is worth in my mind. You want to say something, Sharon? Um, someone wanted to say that um, with uh, COVID, um, you know, do you see it as a silver lining for technology um, that because of COVID, maybe some, there've been more progress than, you know, if there wasn't, because um, a lot of people feel that now with the telehealth and, um, you know, getting healthcare over that, rather than having to always go to the doctor's office, uh, they want to know, what do you think? I think it is an opportunity. I mean, even this seminar three years ago will not be in this format. You would invite me to Toronto or where else, and uh, I will meet with people physically, right? While I'm sitting in Edmonton, you are probably across Canada, I don't know. And we can discuss these things together more efficiently. When it, when it comes to healthcare and when it comes to um, disease that have, that are progressing over time, it has to be, it, it, the question is very delicate in my mind. I can tell you that over the last year, we, may, we had almost exclusively telephone clinics. But that was possible because the CT scans were available, because the PFT, the PFTs were available, six minute walking tests were available. Whenever available, we used PROMs and PREMs. So that gave us a good background before to assess the patients. If these things are not available, it becomes, in my mind, even dangerous to have patients virtually because there is nothing to, to do. I mean, if you don't have that relation with the patients and the solid ground, and you have a structured way of interviewing the patients, because you, you need to ask all the questions that are relevant, otherwise you will miss things. You might miss important things. And in fact, we see um, in, a, in a few areas of more acute diseases like epilepsy that virtual health didn't work that well. So it is still early. Can work, it can work if it is structured. Again, if we use measurements, if we measure how the patient feels as well, you know, so again, PROMs and PREMs, extremely important. It is not just a shortcut, definitely not. Cannot be. So what you're saying, Dr. Farah, is that if patients who live in remote areas or who are not close to the centers of excellence like your region, um, they can just sort of have their community um, respirologist or their uh, primary physician care provider take all those tests, do all those scans and send you the information and then they can collaborate and uh, diagnose the patient. Yes, absolutely so, absolutely so. But again, we should really take this opportunity and add something to what we do. Again, a simple questionnaire, like the K-Build 15 questions and delivered with an email or with a telephone call or you know, on, a, on an iPad, whatever, can give a lot of information. Okay. Um, someone wanted to ask if uh, there's any plans for using home spirometry in Canada. Um, you know, it might be already in use for transplant patient or any studies planned. 
So where, uh, the, the home spirometer is already used for transplant patients, exactly. Especially in the first year or for six months, because these are the most delicate uh, months for a new transplant, obviously. And uh, um, there is no solid evidence yet about it works, how it works. But uh, um, these parameters are actually even covered by insurance. So at this moment, for other studies, yes, there is actually um, a multicenter study running, and I think Vancouver and Calgary are part of it with home spirometers. But again, it are still in the validation phase, which means to produce the data to show that. It is useful and now it has to be used. So it is not yet clinical practice. I don't know if I answered the question. Thank you. Should I move on to this study, which I think is very interesting? Yes, please. So this is a study that was performed in the Netherlands. The Netherlands are among the top three countries in the world, if not the top country in the world for digitalization. So they changed a number of services in public administration already years ago, and they are trying to push really the agenda on uh, um, the new economy. They are investing a lot also as a country. And uh, healthcare, it is one of these areas. They already, five, six years ago, they had companies offering home monitoring systems for, for uh, respiratory disease. There are studies showing that, for instance, uh, COPD exacerbations can be managed, detected and managed without go to the hospital and that reduced by using these home monitoring systems and that reduced 35% of the admissions for COPD. So, very important both for patients and, and the healthcare system. And for what I know, this is the first study of an integrated approach of home monitoring for patients with IPF. So what we did was basically to randomize, you see, 90 patients to the standard treat, the standard way of following the patients. So you know, periodic reviews at the office after three, six, 12 months. And this home monitoring system running in parallel. The home monitoring system uh, consisted of the home spirometry, of a system to report symptoms and side effects of the therapy. All these patients were treated with, with an anti-fibrotic, both in the on my monitoring arm and in the other arm. Patients reported outcomes with the K built questionnaires, plus the a repository for information that the patient could access anytime, sort of little encyclopedia online for, for IPF, a coach, a nurse that could be called anytime, and the possibility to have e consultations. So to speak with the, with the physician as needed. On a, on a tablet, okay? So this was the randomization. And you see, out of 46 patients, one said, this is too difficult for me from the very beginning, okay? It can happen. And other three patients were discontinued because again, technical difficulties, not complying or for physician decision. So at the end of 46, 38 patients completed, for four patients did not complete the K-questionnaires, K-built questionnaires. So there is clearly, again, the problem of how user-friendly any interface we use is and how much patients are willing to use that. On the other hand, here, 38 patients completed, others went off for just a drop off as, as for any clinical trial. So here is the way the patients thought about the home monitoring system. So all these things to do, the spirometry every day, 
the quality of life every other week, reporting side effects, everything, calling the nurse and so on, possibility of calling the nurse and so on. So most of them thought it was easy, easy to use, mostly the, the spirometer. Most of them thought it was useful and pleasant, but there are patients, three out of 10, who say, this is very time consuming for me. Takes a lot of time. And the year is, you see how many times with 42 patients uh, used their spirometry, 97%, which is good over, over 24 months. As I, I forgot to tell, 24 months was the time of the study. PROMS completion, 93%. They didn't use so much the, uh, the library, the access to information. And overall, the experience was good. But here is what the study showed after 24 months. So there was no real difference in the way they, the patient felt about their symptoms, especially shortness of breath and cough they felt better from a psychological point of view, probably because of the possibility to access self-care in a direct fashion, right? right? And uh, what the investigators thought was that the OMS biometry, due to the very high compliance of the patients, so they used it 97% of the time, over 24 months, was working exactly as the we have to see in the pulmonary function test lab. So again, the solutions can be there. We can have the best idea, you know, something that can really revolutionize how we look at patients. But if it is difficult to use for the patients, if it is time consuming, if it is, you know, not pleasant, it will never work. It will never work. And most of all, these are studies. So patients are reminded to use these tools when it comes to clinical practice, education, and uh, commitment, both on the patient side and on the healthcare provider side is key. Otherwise, it will never work. It's a little bit like the peak flow meter for asthma, you know? So it is very important. So, hopes for the future yes this is critical this is really important to understand everything we want to do in healthcare as really to be demonstrated so there are several steps in the so-called health technologic assessment that they have to be respected and fulfilled by all the new technologies please do not think that apps on the Apple store or the Android store are things that you can use for your healthcare. No, it has to be, the, all the interventions have to be validated with studies. They really have to show that they work. We want the interventions to work, to be precise. And they have to be validated by healthcare authorities, but not, not by anyone else. This is just an example of the health innovation cycle. And this is something we are trying to facilitate at the University of Alberta with a specific platform to test the new, um, the new uh, digital solutions. So take on messages. We had the, the digital revolution. We are in this digital revolution. We changed the way we do many things in our life. Just consider home banking, right? 10 years ago was not possible to even to think, you know, not to, to sign a, a check to pay something. Digital revolution and new technologies do offer possibilities to fill the gaps of our healthcare system, of the multidisciplinary approach to IND. But these solutions have to be assessed and validated, and validated in a rigorous and unbiased way. Think about, would you ever check your saturation 
with a pulse oximeter that nobody ever tested before. This is exactly the same thing. Would you ever check your blood pressure with a sphygma manometer that nobody tried, nobody said, yes, this is good, this works well. It is exactly the same thing for this, for all these new solutions, new technologies, hardwares, and even softwares. So, okay. the yes, please. Um, sorry, someone wanted to know, what does HIIP stand for? HIIP stands for, for um, Healthcare Innovation Platform. Okay, is that unique just to um, Alberta? No, it's not unique. There are uh, several universities who are moving in the same direction. What it is unique in Alberta is that we are really uh, bringing together all those who are involved, starting from companies. They have to, to say to, they need to validate their solutions. They, and they are understanding that it is important to have medical devices, not wellness devices. And uh, obviously all the regulatory parts is very burdensome. So we have offices that are taking care exclusively of that. Investments, of course, patients, clinical trial experience, and not least engineering and artificial intelligence. Because the, the, um, how to say, the amount of data we, will, we are managing today is exponential. So we can record, again, what, the first project that I'm running is aiming to collect data about respiratory rate, uh, heart rate, and activities among the other parameters for eight hours per day, every five minutes. So you can imagine what a bunch of data it is. And it will be possible to, to use all this data and to have meaningful conclusions all if artificial intelligence will be used. So that's why we think we are in a good position in Alberta. Thank you. So again, the preliminary studies that I showed you um, suggest that it is possible to use the new solutions. It is feasible, but again, there are some bottlenecks that need to be addressed. Most of all, the education and user friendliness of the tools for the patients, because at the end, they, the patients need to use it. And uh, uh, it must be something easy and accurate again. So it is key to offer user-friendly solutions and ideally capturing data about our health without even having to do something. And is this possible? Well, one of the most, I would say, exciting projects that I've seen is actually collecting cough with smartphones, with an app, during night, you know very well how burdensome and severe can be, cough can be, and how it is impacting the quality of life of patients. And basically patients will not do anything else than just try to sleep or cough while they're asleep, you know. So it, it is definitely possible there are new horizons, it will happen. It will happen in the next five, 10 years for sure. We will have new ways to look at our patients. But again, the quality of the studies, the design of the studies have to answer in a very clear way, yes or not. We can use it, yes or not. There are problems also with privacy, obviously, of data. And this is also addressed by um, by the health authorities. So there are things that companies, new solutions have to comply with. And with that, I would conclude my, my talk. And this is the, um, the motto of University of Alberta, which I like very much. Because again, healthcare should be of everyone, not only of the people who have the money or the possibility to access it. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer. Um, I was just going to ask my audience if you have any questions, please post them.
I do have a couple for you, Dr. Ferrer. Um, one of the, the things that people want to know is how do um, you know, researchers like yourself um, get ideas about what to study or what to create? Because many people are saying, you know, how can they be involved to say, you know, this is what I, I would like to have somebody invent or help me with? That's a very good question. And, you know, in my case, I can tell you that it comes from, from my clinical practice. So when we review things, my clinical practice and research, because one of the um, very important experience, experiences in my career was the Swedish IPF registry. Because we need to see the patients as individuals and we need to see the patients, their stories all together. So all the data, their quality of life, all these things. Again, we, in my mind, it is paramount to have patients involved in this, in this um, process. And as you know, Sharon, I mean, I, I spoke with you about the Alberta initiative, you were enthusiastic about it. And uh, definitely it is important for, you know, it's really learning from the patients and trying to understand even where are the barriers that they experience. That's the most important part. Thank you. Um, Oh, someone wanted to ask, is cell set good for PF since OFEF is very expensive, not supported by insurance for PF? Um, I was going to answer just apart from our part is that the Canadian Polymer Fibrosis Foundation is working very hard with uh, the federal government in each of the provinces to uh, get OFEF onto the ratepayers uh, formulary so that it can be covered. And uh, but unfortunately, until the federal government can have a set negotiated price, we're not able to then push each of the provincials to, to get on that. So not to worry, we are working on that. And then I'm gonna let Dr. Ferrer answer the second part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, it is a, very important, uh, a very important issue. Not because nintadenib is the, how to say, the magic pill, definitely not. We can forget about it. I mean, it is slowing down the progression of these diseases, is not curing them, but at least it gives some hope, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it is about cell set. It is a very good drug, especially for a few PF IODs. So we know that it works pretty well for systemic sclerosis, for instance. It is proven. Um, it should be the, the real question is when we should use immunosuppression with Celsept or Rituximab, which is another good drug in a few settings, and when we should go instead for Nintadanib. And uh, my gut feeling is that we should have an earlier diagnosis, first of all. Patients arrive a little bit too late when fibrosis is already taking mm, wide parts of the lungs. And we should start first with immunosuppression because it makes more sense based on the biology of the disease. There is an inflammation out in your reaction in the lung. On the other hand, if a patient arrives late and there is already a substantial quote of fibrosis in the lung, we don't want to wait other six months. And probably, you know, it depends really on a case by case uh, assessment. But in that case, sometimes I start first with intent and then with cell set. So the question is is cell set a good drug? Yes. At the right time, it is a wonderful drug. It is actually stabilizing the um, lung function for up to two years with no problems. The problem is that the diagnosis has to be at the right stage, so as early as possible. 
Okay, uh, Dr. Farah, uh, another, it's a two-parter. First of all, um, CPFF, uh, we've heard many patients um, sort of ask if, you know, people can create a remote control for changing your television for volume for channel, uh, why hasn't someone created a, you know, a remote control for the oxygen uh, tank and for, you know, oscillating it? Because, you know, when they're sitting, they need less oxygen than if they're standing and walking. So why couldn't there be a remote control for that? Do you know if anybody is investigating in that? Yes, there are, uh, there are um, initiatives and studies going on. So uh, a group in Rome, for instance, is exploring the possibility to titrate oxygen based on the saturation while the patients are working. So the patient will have a pulse oximeter detecting the saturation and depending on the variation of the saturation, the system will be able to adjust automatically the oxygen. A little bit like what is already available for diabetes, just to say, you know, with insulin, basically administered 24 hours per seven by robots implanted under the skin. Um, there are also sensors that could um, could help to see uh, if the um, concentrators are working. So, you know, can be a problem sometimes, especially when patients are in distress to use them. How far this is from implementation? Honestly, I don't know. Okay. Well, Dr. Fair, if you would be able to, maybe you could send me the link to that study and we could share it with our um, community so that for those who are interested, they can go and uh, you know access it from our website and read about the article and and hopefully maybe be inspired and you know push someone to, to make it happen. Uh, the other question for oxygen is that many of the PF community, um, you know, oxygen concentrators are heavy, are noisy. Um, do you know if there's any innovation taking place to try to make them more smaller, compact, more efficient, and maybe less noisy? Yes, companies are working on that. And in fact, you know, there are pretty small concentrators today available on the market. The question is again, the cost and if they are reimbursed or not. Um, so sm smaller concentrators are already available. It depends how affordable are they and how much healthcare systems are willing to pay for that. You know, if you if with one concentrator, I, I just say numbers out of the bloom. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know how much they cost. But if one concentrator is costing ten thousand dollars and the traditional ones are costing three thousand dollars, and with one you cover three patients, obviously it's a question, right? But the that field is moving in that direction, definitely yes. Okay. Well, my last question to you is, you know, given the technology and all the things that are taking place in this world, where do you think we will be five years now having, you know, you having seen some of the technology that's taking place for the research? Where do you think in five years from now that you can say, I think this will come through? I think we will definitely start to use more often and in a better way, patients report and outcome and experience measurements. So not only again asking the patient, how, how are you, how is your cough, but really seeing the numbers, you know, like uh, from one to 10 or uh, on a scale of zero to 100, how, how you, the patients feel at that point or over time as well, the trends. And we will see, I don't know if in five years, but definitely in the next 10 years, we will see that we will start to use this more and more for everything we do, including listening to our lungs and reporting data to the healthcare system. 
that's for sure. Well, Dr. Farah, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I think you've given our audience a lot of food for thought and hope. And here's to hoping that technology um, will uh, will come through. What is the question? Do you, or, um, I no, it was just. It looked like somebody was going to ask something, but I don't think they have. So. Well, again, thank you very much for the invitation. It's very, 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 very precious for me to interact with uh, with you and with the patients. So, whenever I'm always available. Thank you again. Thank you for your time and thank you everyone for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>